Oh, I considered myself then, and I consider myself now, to be a personal political failure. How could it be otherwise? I've led the party, and we've been defeated twice. That's hardly a definition of success. <laughs> I've had from the time I was a child. Be sure that you can convincingly justify the way that you vote. In the streets, at work, wherever you go, justify it there. Justify it there. You can't play politics with people's jobs and with people's services. No such thing as society, just me and now. That's my departure. Society. Now is the time for change. Now is the time for labor. It was it was almost like being called up. There was no real alternative. Uh, what I believed in and wanted to thrive was in peril. And uh, I had to do what I needed to do in order to try and defend it. I therefore declare Neil Kinnock elected as leader of the Labour Party. There was a man who was tough, very, very, very tough. Possibly the toughest leader the Labour Party has ever had. His tragedy was that very often for the wrong reasons, reasons to do not with his intellectual capacity or anything of that sort, but very largely because of social snobbery, he was perceived as being unable in the end to reach out to that further swathe of voters that we needed to secure victory. I think he squashed and strangled a lot of the attractive aspects of his character that are part of Neil. So it ended up with people no longer feeling those attractive things and not quite trusting the remaking of Neil Kinnock. It's very strange that Neil Kinnock, who is, I should think, the great evangelist politician of this half century, presided over the Labour Party, which was less interested in evangelism than it was in the graphs and the diagrams and the figures. I think Neil is one of the tragic heroes of politics in my period, rather like Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. I mean, just as Gorbachev will always be remembered in history as the man with whom the Cold War would not have come to a peaceful end, Neil, I think, will be remembered in history as the man who set the Labour Party back on a path on which it would hope to win power. All right, he didn't uh, win an election and he didn't become Prime Minister, uh, but that doesn't mean that his contribution was not absolutely vital. And I certainly feel, as the leader of the Labour Party, a great sense of gratitude for the work which Neil did and for the inheritance which I got, which is so much better than the one he got. Neil took the Labour Party from a point where it looked as if it was going to go out of British politics altogether. And he brought it back to a confidence in itself and an ability to win and form a government. I think by a lot of personal courage and a sense of vision about what a modern Labour Party should look like, that will be an inspiration and an example to me and many others like me for the rest of our political lives. The day will come when, with the Labour government, the country will get better in its spirit, in its soul, in its fortune.
story of Neil Kinnock and of how he devoted his life to transforming the Labour Party has its roots in Tredegar, in the heart of the South Wales mining valleys. Neil Kinnock was born here in 1942. His mother was a district nurse. Both his grandfathers had been coal miners. His father too worked in the mines and then in the giant Ebervale steel plant. An only child, it was from his parents that he was to inherit his unique mixture of charm and political ruthlessness. My mother would believe the best of everyone. And then when she was left down, uh, really freeze the relationship. Not go for vengeance, but freeze the relationship. Where my father believed the worst of everyone. And when he was proved wrong, there was no more generous or loyal person on the face of the earth. And I sometimes reflect that I might be a combination of both of them. Kinnock joined the Labour Party aged 15 and pursued his political career at Cardiff University, where he was president of the union. It was here that he first met Glenys Parry, whom he married two years later. By 1969, he was the secretary of his local Labour Party, Bedwelty, in South Wales. I was sitting there taking the minutes, when under any other business, the then member of parliament, a nice old chap called Harold Finch, said, yes, I've got a bit of any other business, and I was just closing my minutes book, you know, the meeting was over. And Harold Finch said, well, I'm not going to fight the next election. I'm not going to be the candidate in the next election. And my pencil snapped. <laughs> so I went with my friends uh, down to the Chenard Club um, in, uh, in Pontland Drive. And we had a pint. And I said, right, what do we do, boys? Who are we going to put up? And they said, well, you, you bloody idiot, you are the man that we're going to put up. And uh, that's how I started running to gain the selection in 1969. Put up he was. But as the youngest and least experienced of the candidates, the chances of being selected looked very slim. On the day on which I was selected as the candidate for this constituency, June the 6th, 1969, I came up here in order to write the speech that I was going to give to the selection conference. I knew that I'd have solitude and complete quiet. It was a glorious afternoon. And so I did my scribbling up here. And I remember as I left this mound, which is a pre-Roman fortress, I remember thinking, the next time I come here, I'll know whether I'm going to be a member of Parliament or not. And so the next day, which is a glorious summer's day, uh, in the afternoon, after I'd seen all my family, I came up here with Glenys, and uh, we looked out over the valley, and then we went for a drink in, in the church inn, just on the other side of St. Judas Church here. So it's, it's a special place for many reasons, but that's probably chief among them. The selection meeting was to be the first time that Kinnock, the speechmaker, stole the day. Tied at 75 votes each with the rival candidate, he had to face the selectors once again. They had to come back in to speak again. And, of course, the other candidates weren't as able as he was to make a difference and new speech because they had prepared texts, I think. So he came in with a fresh speech and a fresh appeal, you know, to them as, 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 uh, for, the, for the candidature, and um, he got it by a whisker. By 76 votes to 74, Neil Kinnock was chosen as the Labour candidate, and on June the 18th, 1970, he was elected MP for Bedvelty. The count was so exciting because just to see, because I'd been involved in Anglesey Labour Party, and I'd never seen votes piling up like they did that day in, in the the plaza hall and uh, the floor was just being stacked up with labor votes and with his name on them and it was very very thrilling i think i can probably remember every second of that day because it really was a golden sunlit day um in many ways a perfect day a day of success uh, but a day when the family were all together and uh, there was a sense of being on the lip of the rest of time and it was an enthralling day.
What's more, he had a majority of 22,000. At the age of 28, Kinnock had inherited one of Labour's safest seats, a job for life if he wanted it, and a rock-solid platform from which to launch his political career. He came from the left. His views were clear and uncompromising. The function that the Labour Party set itself, I think, is to ameliorate capitalism. I think it succeeded to a very great extent in doing this, and this is uh, probably one of the reasons why it seems to have lost its sense of purpose. But really and truly, there, there's only one very short answer to can you have socialism in a capitalist, in a market economy, and the answer is no. There are far too many paradoxes, far too many confusions, and too many arguments. I first heard of Neil Kinnock when George Thomas, then Shadow Secretary for Wales, referred to this person, who I couldn't identify, as having opinions as red as his hair. Clearly he had more hair in those days. The red hair went all the way across. And I think the red opinions went all the way across as well back in 1970 or whenever it was. He looked bright, golden-haired, full of vigour, full of zest. His way of speaking, he spoke beautifully, he used the language beautifully. Um, his energy, um, all these things made him stand out. We seem to share the same interests on most subjects. He represented the mining constituency, as I did, and... Uh, he seemed to say all the right things. The only difference was between, uh, between us at the very early part was that I used to go to Parliament every day and he seemed to think it was better to go around the country uh, preaching left-wing socialism and uh, he thought that was more important. This preaching took Kinnock across the country. He covered thousands of miles to address hundreds of meetings of local parties and trade unions. The Kinnock-Skinner comparison was a telling one. Both were men of the left, but Kinnock from the outset was determined to build for himself a power base with the party's rank and file. With his quick wit and powerful speaking style, he soon became the left's rising star. I think that the time that I've most enjoyed being involved in politics as a profession, as an MP, in fact the, the only time I've really enjoyed was around about 75, 76. Uh, there was a lot going on. We had a Labour government you could get things done at the constituency level. Uh, the family was growing up, we were all together. Uh, and all in all, my life was very satisfactory and very fulfilling. I was starting to write a bit, I was uh, getting some public notice, and it wasn't that uh, I got an ego boost from that, but it did uh, justify my existence. It also brought him to the attention of senior figures in the Labour government. Some asked him to become their parliamentary private secretary. But wanting to preserve his freedom to work outside Parliament, he turned for help to his old friend Michael Foote. So I came up with this great wheeze that I would say, no, I'm sorry, I'd love to be your PPS, but I, I can't be because I've already agreed to be Michael Foote's PPS. So I saw him and he said, well, I, I don't really want a PPS. And I said, well, I don't want to be a PPS. I said, but it made my life a bit easier. All oh, right then, he said. I said, well, I'll do it for a year. And he said, well, yes. Well, okay, I mean, well, I'm very glad if you'll do it, but I, I don't see why people have them. Neil Kinnock. By 1977, Kinnock could see that the government was running into economic trouble. He was quick to attack Jim Callaghan's cuts in public spending. The rebel was now the hero of the party conference. Madam uh, Chairperson, Neil Kinnock, Member of Parliament for Bedrashti. Only action is going to get us out of this. And if you take a page from the book of the TUC, if you look at Harry Irwin's speech in the TUC, if you see that £3,000 million worth of reflation now, we're not asking you to let it rip. We just want you to tear it a bit. Tear it a bit for production. Tear it a bit to fight unemployment. Tear it a bit to win the next election and do it now. He wasn't courting the party establishment, but he was nonetheless becoming increasingly prominent. His boycott of the Queen's speech in 1977, when he sat alone in the Commons chamber with Dennis Skinner, was conveniently captured on camera. Too conveniently, thought some. In 1977, Neil spotted me on the bench, sat there on my own, and he said, uh, what do you do here? I said, I sit here and wait till they've finished. I says, uh, I don't, I don't recognise the House of Lords, it's undemocratic, it's elitist, it's based on patronage, and I don't want anything to do with it. And he says, well, I share those views, and he sat with me. And I thought, well, it's very odd, I've been doing this for seven years, 
and this is the first occasion when he's joined me. And the following day, I saw a big spread photograph in the Daily Express. And I just wondered, I thought, it's very odd. I've been sat there on my own for seven years at Daily Express and not cared tuppence. When Neil joins me, somehow or other, they managed to get a photo. Uh, it didn't do him any harm at the time. The following year, Kinnett got onto the National Executive Committee, the party's ruling body. He'd been elected by the party activists whose meetings he'd so assiduously attended. Madam Chairman, uh, comrades, uh, first of all, thanks very much for one thing and another. In his mid-thirties, Neil Kinnock had established himself as a leading MP with a power base amongst the rank and file. But if his star was in the ascendant, the same could not be said of the Labour governments. By 1979, the government's credibility was in tatters. Disagreements with the trade unions had led to the winter of discontent. Jim Callaghan had to go to the country in the worst possible circumstances. Not surprisingly, Labour lost. I still believe that we might hang on until the great dispute with the trade unions. But once there were bodies unburied in Liverpool and refuse uncleared in London squares, and water pipes frozen in Lancashire and trade unionists refusing to unfreeze them. Well, that was the end of the Labour government. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. I thought Margaret Thatcher was going to get away with murder. I spent a lot of time in the late 70s after she became leader of the Conservative Party looking at the material that she and Keith Joseph and others like them were producing. It terrified me. I thought it was simplistic, banal indeed. Kinnock was preparing to make his peace with the right of the party, but the rest of the left wanted revenge. They felt betrayed by the long years of Wilson and Callaghan compromise, ending as that era did in public spending cuts and war with the trade unions. That manifesto was a profound disappointment to the mass of our party. If we're going to have real influence from the rank and file, the grassroots of this party, then undoubtedly we all have to have a say. That what he is doing today is swimming against the tide of history. We saw two Labour governments elected in, in 64 and 74. They both failed, were both booted out by the electorate. They didn't create the great institutions that the Attlee government did in terms of the, the post-war period in a welfare state and full employment. People were looking to make changes so that, that the, the leader was elected by the whole party. MPs didn't have the job for life. We wanted to make structural changes so that we wouldn't ever be betrayed by a Labour government again. So began a bitterly fought war over who should control the party, the parliamentary leadership or the rank and file. Neil Kinnock started out firmly on the side of the rank and file, supporting their drive to rewrite the party's constitution. The left got its way. MPs would have to face reselection at the hands of party activists, and the leader would be elected not just by MPs, but by the whole party. The emancipation, the real liberty, the liberation of the British people. As far as the constitutional changes are concerned, I had a lot of sympathy with those. In fact, I was a participant because I really did believe that there was uh, a need for a more formal mechanism of accountability. And I thought it was self-evidently democratic. Kinnock could also see that giving party activists and trade unions a say in choosing the party's leader would boost the chances of an MP from the left getting elected. Others had spotted this too. I particularly remember the expression on his face when the vote was taken that we should move away from an exclusive franchise for members of parliament and in favour of an electoral college. And I, I remember thinking at the time, he thinks that's a big opportunity for, for him. It's the first time I'd really seen him as a leadership uh, challenger. Kinnock had backed all the key constitutional changes, but he was now tiring of the left zeal for internal party reform. I would condemn them for not realizing much, much more quickly than they did that whilst purification might have been an acceptable course for in the re religious grouping, for a serious political party, 
it should have taken 15th place or 20th or 1,000th place behind the main task of tackling the Tory government. Whilst the Labour Party was fighting its own battles, Margaret Thatcher's government pressed on with its radical programme. I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies, not for turning. <laughs> On economic policy, trade union law and privatisation, they challenged everything the Labour Party stood for. Kinnock felt the battle against Thatcherism should come before the left's quest for internal reform. So he took a job as Jim Callaghan's education spokesman. It was his first breach with the left, early evidence of the overriding pragmatism that was to mark his leadership years. I accepted the position immediately because I'd realized in the previous couple of days that if I was asked to go on the front bench in any capacity, that it really was put up or shut up time that we were going to have to fight, that we were going to be faced with a very right-wing government. I affirm the independence of the parliamentary party and of the Labour government. At the end of the day, they must take the decisions. They are responsible. They have the responsibility... In 1980, Jim Callaghan, exhausted, announced his resignation as party leader, opening the way for the election of Kinnock's closest friend and ally in Parliament, Michael Foote. Foote and Kinnock had neighbouring constituencies in South Wales. They shared a common political hero in Nye Bevan and had known each other since the 1960s. I met him in Tredega and we used to go with several of these mining friends on walks over, over the weekends across the mountains outside Tredega, the same mountains where an iron bevan had walked and where others do and I argued with, started arguing with him then I think the very first person who ever suggested that uh, Neil Kinnock might become the leader of the party or the Prime Minister of the country was Jill my wife she heard the arguments and saw him arguing and said well yes he's the one for it I think Michael Foote in a way saw Neil Kinnock as the son he never had um, he was he, he didn't have children. He loved Neil. I think there's no two ways about it because Neil, he saw as carrying on the tradition of the Labour Party in Michael's terms. But Kinnock didn't want his friend Michael Foote to stand for leader. And I said to him, well, you know my view of you running. I don't think you're going to win. I'm not in favour of you running. But since you are in, I'll fight like hell for you, which I did. And of course the guy won beating the right-wing's candidate, Dennis Healy. The party was now leaning more heavily to the left. I was delighted. I was ecstatic. And I made absolutely no bones about it. I was unrestrained in my response. Uh, I think mainly because my dear friend had won a contest in which he was engaged. And I really do like winning. And I like my friends winning. Through a combination of political skill and good fortune, and after just ten years in the Commons, Kinnock was a front bench spokesman, a favourite with a rank and file, and now Michael Foote was party leader. Neil Kinnock's own prospects were bright, but for his party, a year of civil war was looming. Fight, fight, fight have been used. I don't want to fight anybody in our own party. I don't want to fight anybody in our own party, I repeat. Following Michael Foote's election as Labour leader, the party pressed the self-destruct button. At that time, um, Glennis said to me, can anybody really lead this party? And... Uh, I think that in the months, indeed the years that followed, the question was asked many times. If someone uh, with the passion and uh, the affection of Michael Foote couldn't command sensible, strategic support throughout the party, who could? 
1981 began badly, with the Wembley Conference called to finalise the details of the new electoral college. The left scored a hollow victory in securing the formula most likely to elect a left-wing leader. Labour's divisions were laid bare for all to see. At that time, neither I nor anybody else really could have anticipated that out of that special conference in Wembley would come the development of an alternative party and that the Labour Party, those remaining in the Labour Party, would themselves split and we would give the impression for two years after that that we were concerned about ourselves almost to the exclusion of concern about anything else. Option four. For many on the right of the party, Wembley was the final straw. The day this system is used to elect a prime minister, the whole of the country will be watching the procedures. Why change for a system now, which you know will split the party? When you have a position of this sort, where every aspect of the program was completely against what I regard as sensible social democratic politics and what I'd stood for in government and in opposition, as I say, then um, I thought it was not possible to remain in the Labour Party. The formation of the SDP took away a whole portion of Labour's right wing, pushing the party's centre of gravity further to the left. It also compromised those on the right who stayed behind. There was never any question of me being a defector, but people like me who wanted to modernise the Labour Party knew that the spectre of defection was hanging over us and people were ready to accuse us of being on our way out. We have not yet really changed the structure of power in our society and what we are allowed to do. When we are... Labour's divisions were compounded further when Tony Benn challenged Dennis Healy for the deputy leadership of the party. I was in the tea room in the House of Commons in the small hours and I heard as I passed uh, one of the tables Labour MP saying that Tony Benn had said that he was going to fight Dennis Healy for the deputy leadership. My feelings ran from really bitter anger right through to contempt because the last thing we needed was a contest for a leadership position in the Labour Party, and everybody knew that. But with the momentum behind them, the Ben camp pressed on, believing they could reshape the party. And we'd like to keep them on their toes like we didn't before. As Ben's support grew, he looked set to oust Healy. Kinnock, increasingly concerned about the harm the contest was doing to the party, resolved to act. He now chose to make his final and decisive break with the left. Uh, I became increasingly determined that uh, not only was I not going to vote for Tony Benn uh, for deputy leader, but because of the way in which the contest had been provoked, I was going to do my very best to stop him being deputy leader. So I started writing an article for Tribune and we went away with the family uh, to Italy for holidays. And uh, while the kids played in the pool uh, at this uh, apartment that we were staying in, uh, I wrote the article. As the party gathered for its autumn conference, it became clear that up to 30 left-wing MPs had decided to follow Kinnock's lead and refused to back Ben. The result was too close to call. I knew, like everyone else knew, it was going to be a very close-run thing between Dennis and Tony. But as it became apparent that it was very close, uh, I could feel the tension arising in me. I could feel my whole self tightening. Uh, I don't remember looking down to see if my knuckles were white, but I know that my whole body felt as if they were. Tony Benn, 49.574. Dennis Haley, 50.426. And the extraordinary thing, Tony being alphabetically first, uh, his result was read out, and it was 49 point something, and it didn't appear to occur to the conference for seconds that simply because there wasn't a 50 after his name, he hadn't won. In those moments, what I knew was that if I'd had my time again, 
I would have voted for Dennis Healy just to try and make it that much more certain. Neil Kinnock's abstention in the, the deputy leadership contest was absolutely decisive. Not only did that determine the outcome, him and the handful that did that, but he provided legitimate cover. And uh, nobody else amongst the abstainers had the less credibility to actually do it and get away with it. More importantly, Kinnock had shown a middle way between Ben and Healy, a path the party would soon follow. But in the process, he had alienated many of the party faithful. His NEC vote fell sharply that year, and he came under bitter attacks from former comrades like Arthur Scargill. You say to well, first of all, what, what I should say is that uh, 15, me. I think that the left-wing MPs, or those who claim to be left-wing, actually betrayed not merely their supporters, but the fight that's taken place over many years. And the abstention tactic was really a dishonest tactic. In essence, it gave a, a vote to Dennis Healy. I won't take it from anyone that when I make a decision about what is best in my view, democratic view, for the party, and pursue that course, that I'm being dishonest. The fact is that it wasn't Tony Benn that lost the deputy leadership election yesterday. Tony was a really credible candidate just a year or so ago, and I supported him last year in the shadow cabinet election. If anybody lost him that deputy leadership election yesterday, it was you, the attitude you espoused, and the people like you who espoused them. We're not having them in the Labour Party, mate. We want to beat the Tories. In 1981, this seemed a long you way off. You have to be dead for a long time in the Labour Party before nobody attacks you, don't you? Michael Foote remained unable to reconcile the warring wings of the party. And believe me, I'm not dead yet. I'm here for a long, long time to come. On the NEC, Kinnock was a witness to the constant arguments that raged between left and right. It was something he wouldn't tolerate when he became leader. The National Executive Committee meetings were purgatory. There were people on that National Executive Committee who appeared to be bent consciously on humbling Michael Foote of taking a course that was calculated uh, to make him look ignominious. An executive of a party ought to be a, a, a body that gives the orders and the arrangements, makes the arrangements to fight the enemy. And what uh, some people had transformed the executive into was something quite different. That was a kind of uh, parliament, if you like, a new parliament of the Labour Party, which was, had all its discussions in public. That wasn't an executive, that was a, a parody of an executive. It had to be changed. Foote, struggling with his party, was also ripped apart by a hostile press. Kinnock could only look on. I'd open the paper sometimes and see the way in which they were representing Michael Foote, and I would feel angry despair if I had known what uh, my friend was going to go through. I would have not only advised him that uh, he shouldn't stand, I would have actively sought to resist him putting his name forward, because he, nobody should have to go through that. All the insults, disgusting insults, by lesser people, cowards. Uh, I don't think he should have been subjected to that. Margaret Thatcher's government, in contrast, was winning back support. An emphatic victory in the Falklands War had made her a national hero, and economically, too, there appeared to be better times ahead. The pressures on Labour mounted, and rumours abounded that Foote would go. Senior Labour figures recall that even Kinnock might have been considering a leadership change, a charge that he denies. There were some stories that the ideal ticket would be uh me as leader and Neil as deputy leader. And he very much surprised me once by asking if he could come and have a private chat with me. And I wondered what it was about, and maybe it was about this. And he came along to my office in the little cell block in which the shadow cabinet lives in Parliament. And uh, he just really sat there. I, I was really very unclear why he'd asked to come and see me, whether perhaps he thought I would raise it with him. But there was no time for change. In 1983, Margaret Thatcher called the election, offering more radical policies and a vision of the future. Labour's programme, long and incoherent, was a blueprint for failure. Going up the pretty way the election they can remember for quite a long time past. The 83 election campaign was pitiful. I was going to say a modern political campaign, but we wouldn't have 
run a campaign like that in 1950, let alone 1964. And just for me, for instance, I was supposed to be one of the uh, leading speakers, like other members of the Shadow Cabinet. I, I drove myself around. Uh, I therefore had the full obligation for getting to places on time. I rarely had a microphone. I completely lost my voice. My larynx seized up. Uh, all of the process of trying to get uh, press releases out and so on was completely confused. The morning strategy meetings were so bad that I just stopped going. Uh, it was better for me to get on the trail. And I remember coming, <coughs> coming down from Manchester one Sunday morning to attend a meeting of this committee in the boardroom at Transport House to find absolutely dozens of people there. Indeed, I believe that uh, had it been raining, people who came, uh, who wanted to shelter from the rain might well have got into the meeting and taken a part in deciding our strategy, except that there was no strategy. Labour failed to realise the impact that television would have on the campaign. Where the Conservatives, led by Margaret Thatcher, were slick and professional, Labour was simply bedraggled. Oi! There we are. We would have Mrs Thatcher, uh, her programme lined up, she'd have her speech made or whatever she was wanting to say that day in the can, and she'd be back in Downing Street most nights by 8.30. Poor Michael Foote would come staggering in some hall in Merthyr Tidville at about 5 to 10 and have to go out live on the 10 o'clock news regardless of what he happened to be saying at the moment. I was very determined, as I think a lot of other people were, as a consequence of that experience, that whatever else we did at a future general election campaign, it would never, ever be like that again. Kinnock had been Labour's strongest campaigner. Got the bomb now with Polaris. The young stone listened to us. But as the election drew near, even he seemed to concede defeat. If Margaret Thatcher wins on Thursday, I warn you not to be ordinary. I warn you not to be young. I warn you not to fall ill. And I warn you not to grow old. By election night, it was clear that Kinnock's warning had been ignored. Labour were all but annihilated. Their share of the vote dropped below 30%, the worst performance for more than 50 years. Labour were reduced to a rump of just over 200 MPs. They were seats that nobody reasonably expected us to lose that were going. And I just kept on thinking to myself, where do we go from here? It was the question being addressed to me by interviewers when you chat in between the results coming in. And I had no good answer to it. There he goes. Three Conservative wins so far. Are you expecting to be the next leader of the Labour Party? Um, Mr Foote is the leader of the Labour Party, and until he makes a declaration to the contrary, then all speculation, I think, is somewhat foolhardy. But in his heart, Kinnock felt he was the only man who could unite the shattered party. What I believed in and wanted to thrive was in peril. And uh, I had to do what I needed to do in order to try and defend it. And it just so happened that on that occasion, what I had to do to defend it was run for the leadership of the Labour Party. And I realized what an enormous pressure it would be on time and on the family and particularly on Glenys. Or at least I thought that I realized. I didn't really know. I didn't begin to imagine what it would be. Um, but it was, it was almost like being called up. There was no real alternative. Neil fought a campaign which was ten times better than mine. And Neil caught the mood of the Labour Party in 83. He was young, he was radical, he was a great orator. He was full of life and full of hope. And perhaps most important of all, he was uncontaminated by membership of the Labour government of 74 to 79. It seemed that only a disaster could deny Kinnock the leadership, and it almost did. In July, he was driving back to London after a hard day's campaigning in South Wales. I can remember everything so clearly. The car hit the reservation, bounced off the railing, came back across the road, and I can distinctly remember thinking, well, it'll be okay because I'm going to hit the bank. And I did hit the bank, but the bank was at such an angle that I shot up the bank 
and so the police say, the car spun over in the air and eventually, a long way on, came crashing down its rear end, splitting a petrol tank and then rolling over a couple of times on the motorway. And the only gap that I could see was through the passenger window. So I unclipped my belt and dived out through the passenger window as fast as I've ever moved in my life because I could smell the petrol. Kinnock Neil, 71.272%. Neil Kinnock had walked away unscathed. Nothing could stop him now. I therefore declare Neil Kinnock elected as leader of the Labour Party. He had become party leader at 41. Kinnock was the acceptable face of the left. The election of Roy Hattersley as deputy leader completed the dream ticket. Though from the outset, the two men were to remain curiously incompatible. He did this immensely generous thing. He came to the front and stood up. And if you see the pictures, you'll see that he caught hold of my hand and raised it. As I went up, the Gerald Corfman said to me, hold his hand in the air. Uh, George Brown held Harold Wilson's hand in the air. And Harold always resented it because it gave the impression of a joint leadership. Leaving policy and ideology aside, Neil Kinnock devoted his first speech as leader to a simple call for party unity. What I hoped was, most of all, that people would so le learn from the cataclysmic experience of that general election that they would never, never, never go back to the indiscipline and selfishness an introversion, an indulgence of the years before 1983. Of course, I, perhaps I was hoping for too much. Just remember, all times in all temptation, how you, each and every single one of you sitting in this hall, each and every labor worker watching this conference, each and every little voter, yes, and some other ones as well. Remember how you felt on that dreadful morning of June the 10th. Just remember how you felt then and think to yourselves, June the 9th, 1983, never, ever again will we experience that. Next week, the miners strike and militant. Neil Kinnock reveals how he took on his enemies within the Labour Party. That's episode two of Kinnock the Inside Story next Sunday on ITV.